Welcome back to our study of the doctrine of the Trinity. We saw in our last session that even the Old Testament hints at the truth about the Trinity, though the Trinity is not fully revealed until the New Testament. But our first two sessions have raised for us an important question. If the New Testament plainly says that the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, and if even the Old Testament hints at some plurality in God, with God using language like us and our in some of his speech, then what is it that keeps us from being tritheists? What is it that keeps us from worshiping three gods or believing in three gods? Why is it that Christianity is monotheistic? Now, monotheism is a word you've probably heard. It's a word that means belief in one God or worship of one God. Mono means one, and theism has to do with God. Theos is the Greek word for God. So monotheism is the belief in one God or the worship of one God. Christianity like Judaism and like Islam, is monotheistic. Now, Islam and Judaism, of course, are not Trinitarian, right? Christianity is monotheistic and Trinitarian. But why is Christianity monotheistic? Why, for that matter, was Judaism, was uh, Israel's religion in the Old Testament, even to today, why was it monotheistic? How is it that we have come to believe that there's one God who exists in three persons. And before that, how is it that Israel came to believe that there was only one God? Think about this. In the ancient world, how many cultures were monotheistic? Not very many. Many ancient cultures were polytheistic. If you think about Egypt, or you think about Greece, or you think about Rome, these great cultures, in some sense, significant, influential cultures, were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods, multiple gods. How is it that Israel came to be monotheistic? How is it that the Jews came to worship only one God? Well, we get the answer to that question, at least in part, in Deuteronomy chapter 4. What we're going to see in this session is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament affirm that there is only one God. And we're taking time in our study of the Trinity to recognize this fact because this is absolutely foundational for getting the Trinity right. If we ignore what the Bible says about monotheism, if we ignore what the Bible says about there being only one God, then our understanding of God will be Uh, off track from the beginning. And when we start talking more fully about the Son being God and the Spirit being God, there's no telling what kinds of uh, trouble we might get in if we weren't grounded in the fact that God has revealed himself and has made plain uh, that he is the one God, the only God, and that he is is one. We're going to start with, how did God make that known to Israel? How did Israel come to know and recognize, even though Israel wasn't always faithful to the one God, how did they come to know and recognize that there was only one God when so many other cultures were polytheistic, worshiping all kinds of gods? Well, this is what we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verses 33 to 39. This is spoken to Israel, and it says, Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation, by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now let's pause there. What is he saying? He's saying, has it ever happened before that a God rescued a nation or took a nation 
from the midst of another nation, he says. Right? He's talking about the Exodus. Right? Think about Israel was a nation of slaves living inside of Egypt, probably the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And God came and took Israel out of, which, you know, in one sense wasn't a nation yet, but they were a people, right? And he took them out of Egypt and they didn't fight, right? They didn't wield swords against the Egyptians. They simply left after God had brought so many judgments, or the 10 plagues on the nation of Egypt. They simply left And then as the Egyptians pursued them, God opened up a way for them through the Red Sea, brought them through on dry land. And when Pharaoh and his army tried to follow them, God swallowed them up in the sea. Has anything like that ever happened before? Has a God ever rescued a people from the midst of another people like that before, he's saying? Nothing like that has ever happened. He also says in verse 33, he says, did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and still live? Now that's a reference to God speaking to Israel from Mount Sinai. When they came out of Egypt and they came to meet with God at Mount Sinai and God gave them the Ten Commandments, God himself spoke to them from the mountain. So they heard the voice of God. So they've heard God, they've been rescued by this God in a real, tangible way, both things that have not happened before. And so what conclusion are they supposed to draw from this? Verse 35, it says, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. Right, so their experience in the Exodus and in hearing God speak the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai was to convince them, was to show them that their God is God, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the real God. And this real God says to them, there is no other God. I am the only one. And then he goes on, verse 36, out of heaven, he let you hear his voice that he might discipline you. And on earth, he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Notice this. Notice this. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above And on the earth beneath, there is no other. So the reason that Israel came to know that there was only one God, when so many other people were worshiping idols, and when so many uh, other cultures, well, the culture they came out of, right, the culture in Egypt was probably polytheistic at the time. Um, We, the reason why Israel was not, polytheistic, and the reason why um, Israel uh, was monotheistic instead, or at least was supposed to be, we know at times they were unfaithful and worshipped idols, but the reason at their heart, their scriptures made plain, and they knew they were supposed to be worshipping only the one true God, the reason why they knew that is because God himself had showed up in time and space, had acted in history Uh, as it were, or not as it were, but he had acted in history, right? And he had redeemed them from Egypt and he had spoken to them on the mountain. He had shown them that he was the real God and he had told them that he was the only one. That's why Israel was monotheistic. And at the heart of their, uh, of their religion, at the heart of Judaism, right? Even today, is this statement from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, that statement is what is called the Shema. It's called the Shema because the 
first word in the original uh, language is Shema, means hear, right? So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, I don't know at what point that passage and that statement took on the particular central significance that it has today, but that statement has been there virtually from the beginning, right? Deuteronomy goes all the way back to before Israel had even entered the promised land. And this is what Israel was to know and to believe. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? There's one God, one God. And because there is one God, he deserves all of our worship, right? All that we have. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. As somebody has pointed out, in polytheism, you don't have that claim, typically, to total, complete allegiance. The, you, you might spread your allegiance around among the gods, right? You might worship this god because you want good crops, and you might give a sacrifice to this god because you don't want to get sick, and you might... Uh, give a gift to this God because you want to have a safe journey or whatever. And they're not, these other gods aren't mad about the fact that you worshiped or gave an offering to another God. Spreading it around is just fine. But because there is only one God, Israel is told that all of their love, right? Their whole heart, they're to, to love God with all their heart and all their soul and all their might, all of that is to be directed to the one God because there is only one God. And because there is only one God, he can make a complete and total claim upon your allegiance, upon your love, upon your devotion, because there is no one and nothing else that shares an equal right to your worship, to your love. There's no one, nothing else as high as, as worthy as God, because there's only one God. This truth was continued uh, to continue to be hammered home for Israel. In the book of Isaiah in particular, this truth comes to the fore. Isaiah 45 verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. In Isaiah 46, 8 to 11, it says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. God is reminding Israel, he's the only true God. There is no one else like him. There is no other God. He is the only one. Now, when we get to the New Testament, this truth is, is still affirmed. It does not go away. It is not repudiated. It is not denied. Uh, if anything, it is probably mostly assumed throughout the New Testament because much of the New Testament, um, as others have pointed out, much of the New Testament is written by Jews, perhaps all the New Testament. We don't know for sure the writers of all the books, but likely all the books of the New Testament were written by Jews, People who believe that there was only one God. Jesus, most of the time, was teaching Jews, speaking to Jews, who believed that there was only one God. So this truth didn't have to be brought to the forefront very often because most of the people involved already knew this, right? already believed this. But we do have at least one clear statement, and there are probably others that you could think of, but there's at least one very plain statement about the fact that we worship only one God, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. It's in a passage dealing with whether or not Christians should 
be allowed to or be free to eat food sacrificed to idols. And it says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. So in other words, when they're talking about eating food sacrificed to idols, one of the things they're talking about is, hey, their idols aren't real gods anyway. We know that there's only one real God, right? So that's factoring into the way they're discussing whether or not it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. And then Paul says this, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, right? Lowercase g, lowercase l. Yet for us, he says, verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So Paul says, look, we recognize that a lot of people think there are gods. There are lots of so-called gods in heaven and on earth. Many gods, many lords, lots of beings, right, that people treat as gods or, um, or things they've come up with, they've imagined uh, to be gods. But he says, for us, there's one God, right, the Father. There's only one God. There are not many gods. There are not multiple gods. There are not even two or three gods. There is one God, the Father. So Old Testament and New Testament, it is plain that there is only one God, that we are to be monotheists, that we are to believe in one God and we are to worship one God. Now, this last passage, and this is where we'll close, this passage from 1 Corinthians 8 does raise a question, though. It says, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. How do we put those two things together? How do we say that there is one God... And yet there is also one Lord through whom are all things and through whom we exist. What are we supposed to believe about this one Lord, Jesus Christ? What are we to say about him? Right? That's what we will turn to in our next session as we talk about the Son and his relationship to the Father. Right? We know right, that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity, become man. But how do we explain that? Why do we know that? How did Christians come to that conclusion? What do we see in the Bible that helps us to know that though there is one God, that the Father is God and the Son is God, that's what we'll focus on next time, and the Spirit is God. That's what we'll continue to discuss and discover, Lord willing, as we continue our study of the doctrine of the Trinity. God bless.